Institute webinar on webinar on uh, prevention and screening of lung cancer. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Dr. Hirwa Mamdani. I'm a thoracic medical oncologist as well as director of lung cancer screening program at Kermanis Cancer Institute. Um, I specialize in uh, diagnosis and treatment of lung cancer, and I lead a number of clinical trials to help improve treatment options and early detection of lung cancer. Today, I'm joined by my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Nitin Tamala, Kim Belzer, and Laura Manta, who are essential components of our lung cancer screening program. We also have a very special guest today, Dr. Susie Lawrence, who is a lung cancer survivor. And I'm very thankful for Susie to join us today and uh, share her experience with us. Today's uh, webinar will consist of a number of presentations and discussions, and this will be followed by a Q&A session from the audience. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, so that we don't have any unexpected background noise, all attendees are muted. Uh, this is a live webinar and it is being recorded. It will be housed on www.kermanas.org, so you can go and refer to it at any later time. To ask questions, please type them in the chat box or Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of this webinar. So let's get started. I wanted to start by addressing a very basic question, that is, what is cancer? Human body is made up of trillions of cells. Um, you have a picture in front of you, which is the picture of a cross section of skin, and it shows multiple cells at the surface of the skin. Under normal circumstances, these cells grow and divide to form new cells when the body needs them. Sometimes when the cells are growing and dividing, there could be a typo in the genetic code of the cells. We call them mutations. These abnormal cells carrying mutations are normally eliminated by our immune system. So they just end up dying and getting washed off in the body. Cancer develops when this orderly process is breached. What happens is the cancer, the, the normal cells that are growing and dividing, when they develop mutation, and if they are able to just evade our body's immune system and continue to grow relentlessly, they give rise to a cancer cell. The cancer cell is equipped with a machinery so that it can divide rapidly and it can grow rapidly as well. So eventually these clumps of normal cells Instead of dying, they don't die, they accumulate, and the new cells continue to develop when the body doesn't need them. This clump of cells eventually forms blood vessels to get nutrition and oxygen from the body, and it forms a tumor. Eventually, if this process keeps on going, some of the cancer cells may break off and get into the blood vessels as well as lymphatic vessels, and they can travel to distant areas of the body and establish themselves and form tumors away from the original site of tumor, which we call as metastasis. Cancer can develop pretty much in any area of the body, but when it develops in lung, it's called lung cancer. Most often, the reason for this mutation or a glitch in the genetic code for lung cancer is smoking. Just to look at the statistics, lung cancer is the second most commonly diagnosed cancer in the world. It is trailing breast cancer just by a little bit. But if we look at the graph on our right side, which shows the mortality or death rate from lung cancer, you can clearly see that it beats all other cancers by a significant number. And these numbers hold true in our country as well. Lung cancer is the second most commonly diagnosed cancer in both men and women, but it is again the number one cause of cancer-related death in our country. In fact, deaths from lung cancer account for more deaths than um, those from breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer combined. There are four stages of lung cancer. Initially, when the cancer starts, it's very small, which is when we call it stage one. When it grows a little bit and perhaps spreads to some of the surrounding lymph nodes, we call it stage two. If it is larger and spreads to multiple lymph nodes, we call it stage three. 
And ultimately, when it spreads to other areas of the body, such as brain, liver, bones, or adrenal glands, we call it stage four. The basic difference between stage four and all other stages is that our intent of treatment is curative for stage one, two, and three lung cancers. While except for very few uh, circumstances, stage four lung cancer is considered incurable. Even in non-stage four setting, our chances of curing lung cancer are highest in stage one. And then they go down with stage two and they go further lower with stage three. So our goal should be to catch the cancer at this stage when it is curable and our chances of cure are the highest. Unfortunately, we are in the opposite situation. Nearly 60% of patients are unfortunately diagnosed when they already have stage four or metastatic cancer when it is incurable. Only 17% of patients, meaning less than one in five patients, are diagnosed when it is still localized or stage one when we can offer curative intent treatment. And the reason behind that is that usually small tumors in the lung, when they are stage one and stage two, they're not symptomatic. By the time the symptoms start to develop, the tumor is already stage three or stage four when the chances of curing the tumor are very low, if not zero. So our goal is to detect the cancer at an early stage. And we can achieve that goal by doing what we call a screening. The definition of screening is that we're looking for cancer in people who do not have any symptoms of cancer. So how do we do that? One way of doing it is to take a look in the lungs, to take a picture of the lungs. And the oldest modality of taking picture of the lungs is a chest X-ray. The other way of looking into it is to actually take a sample of the phlegm and put it underneath the microscope and look for cancer cells. Both these modalities were tested to successfully detect lung cancer at an early stage and see if they actually decrease the risk of dying from lung cancer. And unfortunately, both these modalities were unsuccessful in achieving those goals. So if somebody had a chest X-ray when they went to ER or for some other reason, let's say six months ago, it is still possible that there could be cancer in the lung and it just wasn't detected on the chest X-ray. The most successful modality for detecting lung cancer at an early stage or for screening of lung cancer is called low dose CT scan of the chest. It has been proven to be a useful modality by a very large clinical trial that was done across 30 states in the United States. This study called NLST, which stands for National Lung Screening Trial, enrolled nearly 53,000 patients and they included people who were considered to be at high risk of developing lung cancer. And the high risk definition only included smoking as a risk factor. The study included people who were between 55 to 74 years of age. They had at least 30 pack years of smoking history, and we'll be reviewing what 30 pack years means. And they had to be either current smokers or quit within previous 15 years. They were then assigned to receive either a low-dose CT scan of the chest on an annual basis for three years or to get a chest x-ray on an annual basis for three years. And what the study showed is the rate of detection of lung cancer was higher among people who underwent low-dose CT compared to the chest x-ray. And the death rate from lung cancer was lower in people who underwent low-dose CT scan and were detected to have lung cancer. If we crunch up the numbers, it basically comes down to 20% decrease in the risk of dying from lung cancer in people who underwent low-dose CT on an annual basis. We also have to consider that this trial was originally designed only for three years. So if we are seeing 20% decrease in the risk of dying from lung cancer at the end of only three years of getting scans, if somebody continues to get scanned for a longer period of time, this number will be much higher than 20%. Given these results, 
United States Preventative Services Task Force and other major societies endorsed low-dose CT scan as the modality for lung cancer screening for anybody who is between the age of 55 to 80 years who have smoked for one pack of cigarettes for 30 years or other equivalent of 30 pack years. And they have either, they're either currently smoking or have quit smoking within the past 15 years. These results were also confirmed by another very large European study. And in that study, the, these high risk criteria were a little bit different. So as a result, in March of this year, all the major societies revised these criteria for eligibility for low dose screening. Now the criteria include anybody who is between the age of 50 to 80 instead of 55 to 80. And the smoking history has to be 20 pack years instead of 30 pack years. They still maintain the criteria that the person has to be currently smoking or quit within past 15 years. And as a result of these guidelines, we are now we now have the ability to screen a lot more people and save a lot of lives. So that's great news. But the bad news is that there is really no data on utility of low-dose CT screening for other high-risk population. As I mentioned earlier, these criteria include people who have smoked themselves. They don't include anybody who had exposure to secondhand smoke, which we now know that is a risk for development of lung cancer as well. Another fact is that up to 40% of lung cancer cases are diagnosed in people who have either never smoked or they quit smoking longer than 15 years ago, and the guidelines don't allow them to be eligible for low-dose screening. Survivors of lung cancer and other smoking-related cancers, such as head and neck cancer, are also at a high risk of developing lung cancer, but if they do not meet the criteria for the smoking history, unfortunately, low-dose CT guidelines don't allow them to be screened. And same thing goes for uh, people who have history of lymphoma and received radiation to the chest. The other challenge is even among the people who are eligible to receive screening based on current guidelines, only 6% of eligible people are actually getting screened. And these are national numbers. If we divided them into different areas, such as Midwest, the number actually goes down to 3%. There are many different reasons for this uh, problem. And first and foremost is the lack of awareness. One of the major goals of our webinar today is anybody who is attending the webinar, if you're, you yourself or if you know somebody who meet the guidelines for low-dose screening, please, please, please enroll yourself or your loved one to the lung cancer screening program. The other caveat of lung cancer screening is that it's not very straightforward as getting a mammogram or colonoscopy. We really need a multidisciplinary team and structured algorithm to help with interpretation and management of the findings that we have on low-dose CT scan. For example, when we do a scan of the lung, we don't always find nodules or masses in the lung. There are many other structures in the chest which are also visualized through the CT scan. And if there is any abnormality in any of those structures, for example, an aneurysm of one of the major arteries in the chest, or thickening or calcification in the coronary arteries, which are the major blood vessels supplying the heart, or if we find COPD or emphysema in the lungs, we also wanna make sure that people have access to appropriate specialists to um, afford the management of those things. So as a result, we have a multidisciplinary program here at Kermanas Cancer Institute where in addition to myself, Dr. Tamala, Kim, and Laura, who are here, we have Dr. Subani, who is our pulmonologist, Dr. Bakowitz, and Dr. Sternberg, who are our thoracic oncologist. Um, we discuss most of our lung cancer screening cases in our multidisciplinary conferences so that we have a multidisciplinary approach towards interpretation and management of the findings on low-dose CT. So with that, um, I'd like to hand over the presentation to Laura. Um, Laura is a coordinator of our lung cancer screening program. She has been with Kermanos for over two decades and has been coordinating the screening program since its inception. 
Laura will review uh, the structure of our program and eligibility criteria. Laura, you're up next. So thank you, Dr. Mamdani, and I also wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, again, my name is Laura Mantha, and I'm a research nurse and coordinator of the Lung Cancer Screening Program here at Kermanos. My talk today includes a short history and overview of our lung cancer screening program, the eligibility requirements for lung screening, as well as a review of our screening process. So I'd like to start by giving you a short overview of our program. We have been offering lung cancer screening at our facility since 2013 and this was based on the results of that national lung screening trial that showed lung cancer screening using low-dose CAT scans in high-risk adults helped save lives by detecting lung cancer early but it wasn't until 2015 that we developed our lung cancer screening program as it is today and this was based on the United States Preventative Service Task Force who did recommend lung cancer screening as a preventative service um, using low dose CAT scans once a year as a screening test for lung cancer. So due to this recommendation, CMS or Medicare, as well as other private insurance companies agreed with that recommendation and started to provide lung cancer screening coverage as a preventative service benefit to adults who met certain high risk criteria. So our program offers lung cancer screening at two locations, our main campus in Detroit and at the Weisberg facility in Farmington Hills. And Carmanos Cancer Institute is designated as a lung cancer screening center by the American College of Radiology and a screening center of excellence by the GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. So on this next slide, I've briefly listed the components of the lung cancer screening program, but I will go through them again one by one a little later in the presentation. So the process starts with a questionnaire to check eligibility for screening. Next, we provide education about the screening program itself, including how the process works, as well as benefits and risks of screening. And this education is provided at a visit with our Carmenos healthcare provider. After, after this discussion, an order for the CAT scan is written and the test is completed on the very same day. So the next two components, image acquisition and image interpretation, will be covered by Dr. Tamala in his presentation a little later. Uh, then we have communication of the results of the screening scan back to you. And finally, if any abnormality is found, arrangements are made for any follow-up that may be required. So who should be screened? And again, what are these high-risk criteria? So to be eligible for lung cancer screening at this time, if you have Medicare insurance, you must be between the age of 55 and 77. You also must be a current or former smoker who has quit within the past 15 years and have a smoking history of at least 30 pack years. Lastly, there must be no signs or symptoms of lung cancer. And what this means is that you don't have any new or any worsening symptoms from your baselines, such as shortness, shortness of breath or cough. And these eligibility criteria that I've listed are very similar to the original criteria that were used in the National Lung Screening Trial. So if you look at the diagram to the right of the screen, you'll see how we go about calcul calculating pack years of smoking. So the number of years you've smoked is entered into the first box on the top, and then it's multiplied by the average number of packs of cigarettes uh, smoked per day, and that number will then equal the number of pack years of smoking. So for example, if you smoked one pack a day for 30 years, that would equal 30 pack years of smoking, or um, if you smoke two packs a day for 15 years, that would also equal 30 pack years of smoking. So let's talk about insurance coverage for a few minutes. Um, Medicare started covering the cost of screening as a preventative service benefit with no copay or cost sharing as of February 5th, 2015, using the criteria mentioned in the last slide. However, CMS is currently reviewing the United States Preventative Service Task Force new recommendations that Dr. Mamdani discussed earlier. And if they agree to these recommendations, this will allow more people to be screened starting at a younger age of 50 instead of 55, and would also include those with a lower smoking history of 20 pack year or greater instead of the 30 pack year or greater smoking history. And this is great news and we hope to have a determination about this in the coming months. Lung cancer screening will be covered uh, by most commercial insurers using the above criteria of age 50 up to age 80 and a 20 pack year smoking history. However, there may be a time lag for this coverage to take effect. And again, in most cases, it is covered as a preventative service with no co-pay or cost sharing. So, but we do recommend that you check with your health insurance plan to see if lung cancer screening is a covered benefit as not all plans are the same as we know and may have different coverage rules. And we can help you with that if you need assistance. 
So the next slide provides some information on how to contact our lung cancer screening program. To request lung cancer screening, you can either call our toll-free number at 1-800-527-6266. You can email us at screening at kermanos.org, or you can go onto our website at kermanos.org and fill out an online request form. There are also additional resources and information about lung cancer screening available on this website. Once we receive a screening request, our staff will contact you and complete the eligibility questionnaire. And if eligible, the screening process will move forward as I will describe for you in the next slide. So finally, I'd like to take you through the steps in our screening process using the diagram here. So starting at the top, when we receive a call or an email requesting lung cancer screening, a trained staff member will review initial eligibility with you over the phone through a short questionnaire. Once this questionnaire is completed, it is sent to the program coordinator, who will then call and ask some additional questions. And if eligible, we'll provide an appointment for a screening visit, as well as for the low dose CAT scan. And the purpose of this visit, again, is for a discussion with a healthcare provider about the program itself, benefits and risks of doing lung cancer screening, as well as for providing smoking cessation counseling. And this visit is required only one time before the CAT scan, uh, the first CAT scan for screening is completed and not in subsequent years. And our physician assistant, Kimberly Belzer, who we'll hear from in the next presentation, does perform most of these screening visits for our program. At the time of the visit, a prescription for the CAT scan is provided, and you will be directed to the CT department to have your screening CAT scan. And then once the CAT scan is done, your visit is complete for the day. After the radiologist, radiologist reviews the scan, it is reviewed again by our program director, and then the results are communicated back to you over the phone and in the form of a follow-up letter to you and your primary care doctor if you have provided this information at the time of enrollment. If the results are normal, you would continue with annual screening and you will receive a reminder call about four weeks before you're due for your next uh, yearly screen. We will confirm eligibility and schedule the next yearly screening scan for you. If an abnormality is found, the results will be reviewed and discussed in our multidisciplinary team meeting and the final recommendation of this group meeting will be communicated back to you and any recommended follow up will be arranged at that time. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Mamdani. Thank you, Laura. That was very informative. Um, we will now move to our next presentation by Kim Belzer. As Laura mentioned, Kim Belzer is a physician assistant on our lung cancer screening program. Kim has been with uh, Kermanos for over two decades, and she is an essential component of our program. So. Kim, you can go ahead with your presentation. I will share the slides for you. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Mamdani. Um, my name is Kim Belzer. I'm a physician assistant here at the Carmenos Cancer Institute. I'm working in thoracic oncology for over two decades, as Dr. Mamdani has mentioned. I'll be talking today about the shared decision-making visit and smoking cessation. So a shared decision uh, making appointment is a one-time face-to-face encounter done on the same day as the initial CT as Laura has mentioned. Together, we make the decision to proceed with the CT and confirm eligibility, and then proceed further on with the lung cancer screening program. It also provides the patient information on the background of the program and information regarding possible results of the CT scan. It is a chance to have your questions answered. Um, and we will also talk at that time regarding smoking cessation if you are continuing to smoke. Um, so now a few slides about um, smoking cessation. Prevention is always better than a cure. Undergoing treatment for a cure is not easy, um, and so preventing by stopping smoking is your best bet. Um, a cure is never guaranteed, um, so smoking cessation can help prevent multiple um, diseases uh, the foremost one being, of course, lung cancer and many diseases of the head and neck, heart disease, diabetes, many um, diseases can be um, helped or prevented by stopping smoking. Next slide, please. So the benefits of smoking cessation occur almost immediately. Um, 20 minutes after somebody stops smoking, the heart rate and blood pressure tend to drop. Within a few days of smoking cessation, carbon monoxide level in the blood drops back to normal. In two weeks to three months, the lung function of that person improves. Within one to 12 months, um, cough and shortness of breath improve. Within one to two years of smoking cessation, the risk of heart attack tends to drop. In five to 10 years after stopping smoking, the risk of cancers of the mouth, throat, and voice box are cut in half. And most importantly, 
10 to 15 years after smoking cessation, the risk of lung cancer is about half that of a person who is still continuing to smoke. So how do we stop smoking or how do we counsel people to stop smoking? Next slide. There are two components of cigarette smoking. There's the addiction to nicotine and of course the habit. We have to conquer both of these issues to be successful. So firstly, let's try to get rid of the nicotine addiction. So how do we do that? Well, there's nicotine, nicotine replacement therapies, which comes in forms of patches, lozenges, or gum. These are available over the counter without a prescription. These medications supply nicotine without the hundreds of harmful chemicals that smoke contains. It also helps to lessen the uncomfortable feelings that come when a someone stops smoking, um, stops getting nicotine from the cigarettes that they are smoking. Um, and then there are prescription medications that are available, bupropion, uh, which is also known as Wellbutrin. It helps to decrease the cravings and other nicotine withdrawal symptoms. And then of course there is, um, which everybody has probably heard or seen commercials for is Chantex. This mimics some of the effects that nicotine has on parts of the brain and it reduces the urge to smoke and it reduces the withdrawal symptoms. Um, other patients and people have tried many different things, um, acupuncture, acupressure, hypnosis, cold turkey, whatever works for you is the, or a combination of all of these things can really help with smoking cessation. Now there's the habit that we also need to conquer as well. Um, people like to smoke after dinner, maybe get up, take a walk, use a lozenge, put a hard candy in your mouth, do an activity. Um, sometimes people like to smoke with their coffee, change up your drink of choice to maybe some tea or something that maybe will just change the habit. So again, we have to break both the nicotine addiction as well as the habit. Next slide. Um, also, um, people do use alternatives, including vaping and marijuana. Um, these are not recommended ways to stop smoking. Um, we know that vaping can cause um, some lung disease, interstitial lung disease, uh, which is not um, a good thing to do um, when you're already smoking cigarettes. So we would like to put those aside and try um, non-smoking types of um, smoking cessation products. And as you can see here, there's many resources to help us to quit smoking. Um, there are also many others, including the American Cancer Society. Most institutions, um, medical institutions do have smoking cessation classes that are provided some community centers. Um, during the COVID pandemic, unfortunately, some of these have been put on hold, but I am hearing that some of them are getting back um, into um, active, um, recruiting active members again. So this is always something um, to uh, keep in the back of your mind if you needed some extra help, these smoking cessation classes as well as these other resources are key in helping you uh, to quit smoking. Just remember at the end of the day, never quit quitting. It's very important um, to continue. If the first time doesn't work for you, try it a second time, try a different way, but it's very important to never quit quitting. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That was uh, that was excellent. Um, of course, prevention is better than cure, and quitting smoking is not easy. Um, we're lucky today that we have all the different resources available to us in the form of medications, counseling, and non-medical uh, resources that can help you quit. Um, so we'll move on to our next presentation by Dr. Nitin Tumala. Uh, Dr. Tumala is uh, an assistant professor of radiology at Karmanis Cancer Institute and Wayne State University. He specializes in reading low-dose uh, CT scans for lung cancer screening. So Dr. Tumala. Dr. Tamala, you're on mute, I think. Thank you, Dr. Mundani. Oh, there you go. Hello, everyone. My name is Nathan Tamala. I'm a radiologist at Carmanis Cancer Institute. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. I will be talking to you about the radiology portion of the lung cancer screening program. Specifically, I'll be talking about the low-dose CT exam and how we evaluate the CT exam.
First, I'll be talking about the image acquisition portion of the screening process. So we use a multi-detector CT exam. With this examination, no preparation is required. There's no fasting required. Additionally, no IV contrast dye is required. So no IV line will, need, will be needed for the patient. The whole process of getting a low dose CT examination is pretty quick. So when you arrive in the department, the radiology department, you'll be checked in. You'll be asked a few brief questions to make sure you're asymptomatic, given that this is a screening CT exam. And then after that, once you're positioned on the CT scanner table, the technologist will ask you to take a deep breath and hold it. And then the scanning takes place, which only lasts about 10 to 15 seconds. So often when we talk about low-dose CT exam, uh, patients have questions and concerns about radiation exposure. So the radiation dose for low-dose CT is very low. It's about five times lower than a regular CT scan, hence the term low-dose CT. It's about three milligrays for an average patient. Often it's much less than that. Just to give you a reference, we receive about three to five milligrays of background radiation annually. And also don't forget the most important thing here is that we do these exams because the benefits outweigh the minimal risk. So once the images are acquired, they are sent to the radiologist for interpretation. There are very specific criteria that need to be met to be eligible to interpret the CT exam. One of which is that the radiologist is board certified or board eligible. Here at Carmanis, all the radiologists are board certified. The whole goal of low-dose CT exam is finding very early lung cancers. So we do that by looking for suspicious lung nodules. So when a radiologist, when we are reviewing the images, we look at each nodule. If the patient has nodules, we look at each nodule very carefully and we take multiple factors into account. We look at their size, the shape, and the density of the nodule, and then we put it all together and give it a score. After that, we formulate a report. We use a system called lung rats, which was modeled after bi rats, which is used for breast cancer screening. Here at Carmanis, we use version 1.1, which is the latest version. And the importance of using lung rats is that we all use the same language and also helps us uh, guide towards the appropriate management pathway. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes just giving you a brief overview of what lung rats categories mean. Because when you get a letter or when your physician gets a letter, these are the categories that they'll see. So I wanna to explain to you what these mean. So category zero is essentially an incomplete exam. Either we need an old exam to review it to com uh, to, for comparison, or portion of the lungs were missed and you may be brought back to get additional images. This is very, very, very rare. Categories one and two both mean a negative screening exam. So when you see one or two, you will just have to return in about 12 months for your next annual low-dose screening CT examination. So three, category three is probably benign. What this means is that we see a nodule that is not very concerning, but we wanna keep an eye on it. We don't wanna wait 12 months. We wanna keep a closer eye. So we wanna bring you back in six months to re-image the lungs. Categories 4A and 4B, so both fours, are suspicious findings. As you can see here, as the category increases, the risk of cancer increases. So for categories uh, four, we have multiple options on how to proceed, which include repeating a low-dose CT examination in three months, getting a PET scan, or we could forego both of those options and go to uh, a CT get a biopsy if we think the nodule is concerning enough. But more often than not, we're either doing a, a very short-term follow-up CT examination or we're doing a PET CT to further assess the nodules. I think Dr. Mamdani had mentioned this before. At Carmanos here, we 
every time we assign someone a four cat category four or sometimes even a category three, we review the images in our multidisciplinary conference that we have every week here, where the oncologists, the pulmonologists, surgeons, and the radiologists are present. We discuss the images and then we make a decision on how to proceed. Sometimes on a low dose CT examination, we see other significant findings. For example, really bad coronary artery calcifications. Uh, we may see an incidental breast nodule. We may see aneurysms. So when we see that, we give this additional category S to have this patient uh, get additional clinical follow-up based on what we see. So to finish up my portion of this talk, I wanted to show you some real life examples. I'm hoping that this will highlight the importance of screening. So the first case is a 65 year old woman with 40 pack year smoking history. So on the, the, right, the left side of the screen is the right lung. So in the right upper lobe, this image is just blown up. We can see this patient has a irregular, we call it a spiculated nodule in the right upper lung. This nodule measures 17 by 13 millimeters. Based on the lunget, lunget scoring, this was a 4X. What I'm not showing you here is the patient also had lymph nodes, which increased the suspicion of lung cancer, hence the X portion. This patient ended up getting a biopsy, which showed this to be a lung cancer and she was treated with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Second uh, patient, 58 year old male with 42 pack year smoking history. So this is the initial screening exam. And on the initial screen exam, you can see a very small nodule. This nodule measured about five by six millimeters and which qualified into the category three, uh, into the third category. And we, we talked about it earlier, category three is probably the benign, and we wanna keep a close eye, and we wanna do a six month follow-up CT examination. So this patient came back for a six month follow-up CT examination. Unfortunately, on the six month follow-up, this patient's lung nodule grew. This is why we do a six month follow-up on a lung rats three, and this ended up being a 11 by seven millimeter nodule. Category four B was given. This patient ended up having a PET scan to further work up this nodule. And the PET scan showed activity. The biopsy was done, which showed this to be a lung cancer. And given that this was the only finding on the scan, we caught this very early on, the patient underwent surgical resection. The last patient I wanna talk about is a 77 year old woman with 50 pack year smoking history. The initial screening scan was done in 2015, which was a negative exam, which is a lung rats one. The patient had no nodules. On a follow-up scan, which was done a year later, you can see I'm showing you the same exact slice here, same exact level. There was no nodule here, and now there's a nodule in the left upper lung, and the nodule measured nine millimeters, which makes a 4B. And we talked about it, category four is suspicious. And this patient ended up getting a PET scan. And as you can see on the PET scan, there is uptake. It's a little, uh, you see a little bit of color on this uh, nodule. The patient ended up getting a biopsy, a CT scan biopsy. The biopsy showed small cell lung cancer, which is one of the subtypes of lung cancer. The patient underwent radiation therapy and is doing well. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for the time. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Mamdani. Thank you very much, Dr. Tamala. Thank you for sharing some of those uh, scans. It was very instructive, very interesting, and uh, really underscores the importance of follow-up imaging once the screening has started. Um, so next we will go to Dr. Susie Lawrence. I have uh, had the privilege of knowing Susie for over two years now. Um, Susie participated in lung cancer screening program um, and uh, today she is here with us uh, for sharing her experience with lung cancer screening and uh, um, her experience battling lung cancer. Susie? Thank you very much. Um, I 
got into the lung screening, lung cancer screening program in a kind of an odd way. My primary care physician was out on medical leave and I saw a nurse practitioner and she took a great deal of time to get a full medical social history. And when I let her know that I was eight years after quitting smoking, after 54 pack year history, and that my father had been a smoker and he was 10 years out from quitting and was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And he already had metastases to his spine and we're not certain, but probably to his brain as well. And he was dead within three months of his diagnosis. So I got into the screening program and <clears throat> the very first scan showed some suspicious nodules, some ground, what they called ground glass nodules. And the decision was made that I would continue to be screened every six months. And so I started in September of 2016. There were no changes until my scan in January of 2019. And one of the nodules had grown and we weren't certain whether, I discussed with Dr. Subani, I asked him what he would do and he said, let's wait six months and check again. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason I guess was that it wasn't certain that we could get a clean biopsy, it wasn't that large. And so getting a false negative would, would not be a good plan. So anyhow, um, in August of 2019, the nodule had gotten significantly larger. I had a biopsy. I was diagnosed with stage one um, adenocarcinoma in situ, which meant it was just in one place. And six weeks, eight weeks later, I had um, the upper lobe of my left lung removed. Um, and I'm very fortunate to say that I have no signs of cancer. Um, I've been screened every three months because of course I had a history of lung cancer. Um, and for the first year screened every three months, no, no, nothing suspicious found. Um, the second year I was screened every four months. And when I saw Dr. Mondani a month ago, the decision has now been made that I'll be screened every six months. And still continue to keep an eye on things because there's no guarantee it won't come back. But I feel really fortunate to have had the opportunity to be in the screening program. And for anyone with these risk factors, talk to your primary care physician, do whatever you can to get into this kind of a screening program because, um, you know, as Dr. Mondani has said, the, the later the cancer is staged, the less likelihood of survival there is. And not only is there a lower um, chance of surviving, but your quality of life is going to be more negatively affected the later the staging is. So that's about all I have to say. I feel very, very fortunate, not only to have been in the screening program, but to have had the opportunity to work with the really fine physicians at Carmanos in the pulmonology lab. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, I'm sure it inspired a lot of our attendees today. Um, and there may be questions from the audience, but I wanted to go ahead and ask you one question myself. When you were first offered the lung cancer screening um, based on the smoking history, as you said, what were some of the thoughts that came across your mind? Um, were you ever concerned about um, some of the downsides of screening or were you concerned that you might be exposed to radiation from CT or false positives and so on? Um. Honestly, no, I just felt really fortunate to be in a screening, to be monitoring and trying to find out if there, if there was cancer and if so, catch it early. Um, my father's only screening had been a couple of x-rays 
from the time he quit smoking. And of course, x-rays are not the state of the art or the gold standard. They probably, but they were in 1995. So, um, you know, he when his when his primary care physician found out he'd been diagnosed with stage four and the physician looked at his x-rays, he says, oh, I see that could be possible. But in just looking at the x-ray, it hadn't occurred to him. So I was just I was really glad to be in the program. I was a little I was frightened when I got the I, I was actually handed the um, radiologist report and I read it and it was scary um, because radiologist reports are not very they state facts they don't um, go any further than that and so I was doing a lot of Google searches trying to find find out what a ground glass nodule is and what does it mean. And there was, um, as I said, this, I, I got in the program in, in uh, 2016, and I don't think the protocols were quite the same in the program as they are now. So I was, I had the results and I didn't have an appointment with the pulmonology lab for, I don't know, three or four weeks. So that was a very, that was a fraught period of time. Like I, I didn't know what I was walking into. And then of course I saw Dr. Subal. Actually, I, I think at that time I saw Dr. Gad Giel and um, both he and Dr. Subani like to take the paper on the back of the examining table and draw pictures <laughs> that make things really very clear to the patient and, and are um, take some of the fear out of it, I think. That, that is so true, Susie. And um, um, not knowing what to make of the information that you get, that can be very, very scary. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about Google, Susie. Um, so certainly Google is not, or as I like to call it, Dr. Google. Um, <laughs> it's not a comprehensive source of information because everyone is different. Everyone is, uh, everyone's right. situation is very different. Did you use any other resources, websites like cancer.gov or anything else while going through I, this journey? I went to the, um, I think it was the American Lung Association and tried to look at that, but um, the information is really broad stroke and, mm -hmm. and even the Google stuff, I got to the point where it's like, I could go down a rabbit hole and get myself in a dizzy tizzy or I could wait till I saw the doctor and, and get the information from him or her. And that was what I decided to do. And I did the same thing once I got diagnosed. Initially, I looked, you know, I was like, oh my God, I really have cancer. What do, you know, what does this mean? And you really can't get an answer on, on Google and you can't get an answer that applies specifically to you on any of the sites that I went to. And so I, um, I decided just to participate with my physicians and to be an active participant, not to just let them make my decisions for me, but to try to get information from them and to have them help me make decisions that would work. Mm -hmm. That's uh, this is so informative, I'm sure, for a lot of our participants, Susie. If you wanted to give them one message, of course, there are a lot of things that we would like to say to them, but at the end of today's session, if there was one message that you want them to take home with them, what would that be? Um, it, it would be that if you meet the eligibility criteria or you think you might meet them, talk to your primary care physician and you know when when everything is said and done our health care we're responsible for it we have to advocate for ourselves each of us as we see our doctors needs to make sure that we're getting answers that we understand and that we're bringing questions to them and in some cases you may need to take you know a family member or a friend with you to help you ask the questions or to remind you what questions arose in your conversations with that family member or friend. Because it's a, the minute you get that diagnosis, it's, it's emotionally, um, 
it's deer in the headlights. It's scary. Um, it's not the death sentence that it was 40 years ago, but it's still that risk attaches and it's helpful to have somebody to, to help, even if all they do is write down the answers because you can ask the question and hear the answer, but you're not really hearing and processing the answer because it's, it's just a really intense um, experience. We all stand by that message as well, Susie, that anybody who is eligible for lung cancer screening, they should absolutely get screened. If you know somebody who is eligible or who has a smoking history that may be eligible, please, please, please spread the message for getting screened for lung cancer. Because as we have all said during this session, lung cancer screening with low dose CT saves lives. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susie. We really appreciate you being here and sharing your experience with us. It's really a pleasure to be here, literally to be here. I had, I had no symptoms. The only sim possible symptom I had was coughing. But I, I have a history of 54 pack years of smoking. I've coughed my entire adult life. So to me, it wasn't a symptom. Mm -hmm. So instead of relying on symptoms or waiting for symptoms to mm -hmm. develop, um, yeah. screening is the way to go. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much, Susie. You're very welcome. So we have some questions from the audience. We'll go to first question from Alicia. Um, is there an option for those who are not qualified, like those with a lower smoking history uh, and family history? And is there an option to self-pay? And if so, how much would that be? Um, Laura, how about you take this question? Um, well, right now we really don't have um, any other option outside of you know, qualifying under the screening guidelines. Uh, we do follow the screening guidelines for um, anybody who's going to be getting a lung screening. Uh, if your insurance doesn't cover screening or there's any issues like that, we do offer a pay, a self-pay option. It is at a reduced cost. Um, at this time, I'm not exactly sure how much it is, um, but we would hook you up with um, the individuals in our department that would work with you um, to get that information to you and um, and then you can make your decision from there about moving forward with that. Unfortunately, as Laura said, we really don't have the ability to do this screening outside of these guidelines without having to kind of get stuck with some type of uh, out-of-pocket cost. And contrary to what I just said about Dr. Google, as Laura was speaking, I Googled the cost of low dose screening and it gave me <laughs> a very wide range of starting from $300 to $6,000. So another example of how information can be inaccurate on Google. Um, but um, you know, if there is somebody who is interested in getting screened, uh, we have uh, uh, a team of people who um, you can speak with and uh, find out what the copay or out-of-pocket cost would be. Then we have a comment about uh, radon, and this is a very good comment. Um, Liz is saying, wanted to encourage folks uh, to have their homes checked for radon gas the second leading cause of uh, lung cancer behind smoking. Most county health departments have home test kits that you can request for free. Winter is the best time to test as your home is generally closed up. And then there is a website, michigan.gov slash radon. Um, and uh, definitely radon is a risk factor for development of lung cancer. And uh, unfortunately it is not, um, under a lot of people's control, we have to go to policymakers for uh, in order to make some changes. But we are our own advocates for the health, so definitely check that out. This website is very helpful, michigan.gov slash radon. So thank you, Liz. And then we have um, some comments and compliments. Thank you, everyone for those compliments. Thank you for joining. 
Um, we have a comment from Joe Baker. Um, I will always be an advocate for screening since I have been diagnosed. Many thanks to my PCP for forcing me to get the initial x-ray. Definitely a very, very, um, definitely a great comment. It's very important for everyone to uh, get screened, definitely with CT scan um, that we recommend, especially if you qualify um, based on the smoking history. Any other questions? We still have five more minutes to go. So anybody from the audience, if they have any questions. I actually have a question. Um, what if you're 16 years, like in three years, I'll be 16 years out from quitting smoking, does that mean I can no longer be screened or would I continue to be screened because of having been diagnosed with cancer? Um, that's, that's a great question. So answer is, the answer is different uh, under two different okay. scenarios. Okay. One is uh, for somebody with diagnosis of lung cancer, generally we continue to screen for it. I shouldn't say screen, it's a surveillance scan, actually not a screening right. CT scan. We continue surveillance at least until five years. Okay. And at the time when we hit the five years mark, we generally think that we have cured the lung cancer. We still wanna keep looking for any delayed recurrences. So we mm -hmm. have the ability to do annual CT scans for surveillance purposes. Okay. If at that point somebody meets the criteria for a lung low dose CT screening, I generally put them on lung cancer screening program. But as you said, if you no longer qualify for it, we're still able to do annual okay. scans because of the surveillance strategy. Got you. Now the situation is different for somebody who is never diagnosed with lung cancer and they have been on screening program, the scans have been fine. And once they hit that 15 years mark after quitting, they unfortunately no longer qualify based on these guidelines. So again, we run into the issue of doing scans with some form of out-of-pocket cost. I hope that changes soon. As I mentioned that up to 40% of people who are diagnosed with lung cancer, they have either never smoked or they quit 15 years, uh, they quit longer than 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we definitely need more kind of an extension of that criteria. Right. I'm very yeah. hopeful though that from the very beginning um, and up to now, the guidelines have changed in terms of the pack years of smoking history mm -hmm. and the age criteria. So I'm very hopeful that that 15 years criteria will be changed um, right, in the right. near future as well. Okay. Um, and then we actually have a question. Uh, could you please talk a little bit more about false positives? Um, Dr. Chamala, perhaps you can take this question. So, I mean, that's a very good question, actually, because it's one of the things that we think about, right? You, you lung rats three, four, uh, three and fours are essentially positive exams. So fours are obviously more suspicious, but threes are the ones that are between. You're not sure it's suspicious. You're not sure it's benign either. So about 24, I think about 24% of uh uh, low dose CT examinations are read as positive screeners. So obviously not 24% of 24% of the patients have lung cancer. So vast majority of them are false positives. Thankfully, we most of the time we just follow up positive scans with additional scans or a PET scan. We don't go do something invasive. Very, very rarely do we do a biopsy based off a positive uh, uh, scan. So yes, there is, to alleviate the concern of a positive scan or a false positive, we do follow up CT scans to make sure it is a true positive before we do something that's invasive. That's exactly right. And that's where the discussion among multidisciplinary team comes into play. That if there is a suspicious scan, we want to review it with uh, the team of specialists and see what everybody thinks. It, 
it's very possible that some of the findings that we see, they may look suspicious on the CT scan, but they may not actually be cancerous. So multidisciplinary team discussion and decision-making is very important. And as Dr. Tamala mentioned, 90% of the positive scans are false positive. So um, again, when you have such a high rate of false positive, it is very important that the decision is made in a logical way. Um, and then Laura has a question. Um, I'm interested in learning how you market your uh, screening program since it's a referral program. Is it um, primarily marketed to PCPs and other physicians or other marketing methods? Um, so we have um, uh, members of our awesome marketing team here um, who can uh, get in touch with Laura to answer that question. In general, what we try to do is to raise awareness among people um, and uh, encourage them to enroll and call us on their own um, to enroll in the program if they are not referred to us by the PCP. Uh, we also try to raise uh, awareness among the PCPs as well. Um, so we generally approach this from two different perspectives, um, speaking with the physicians as well as the individuals um, to try and increase the coverage of screening. We, we have to do better than the 6%. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour, uh, 1.01 p.m. Uh, thank you everyone for joining the webinar. Thank you for all, all the speakers and Susie, thank you for joining and sharing your um, experience, thoughts and insight into lung cancer screening. We hope to continue to do this webinars on periodic basis. Uh, please don't forget it's Lung Cancer Awareness Month, November is. Um, this is the best time to spread awareness about lung cancer screening and save lives. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.